dude, no, dude, you're skipping. You're skipping so many details here. So, so the the one first detail is for, so like I'm in the front seat and his wife Tessa is in the back seat, like in the middle in the middle seat, and we're getting pulled over. And Tessa's like, "God damn it, AJ, we just got pulled over like last week. You just got a ticket last week. Like, what's this for the insurance?" She's like, she's like making a big deal. AJ's like. Could, couldn't care less. It's God like, oh, damn it. I was ready to fucking pull over. And so the cop, before they start shooting the shit, the cop comes up and he's like, you realize you were going like double the speed limit here. And, and AJ was like, oh yeah, crap. They, they just they just changed like the school, you know, whatever. And the best part of it was, is that we had just gone by AJ's wife's school. So like the school zone was like AJ's <laughs> wife's school. So, so like he was he was, was like oh, I, didn't, I didn't notice it was it was a, a 25, but it was his wife's school. So like and so so the the cop so we're thinking like AJ's gonna get like the second ticket. He might lose his license, he might do all this stuff. Instead, he starts shooting the shit with a cop about shooting him. Like <laughs> and then the guy comes back, he's like, ah just slow it down man, keep going. I'm like, what just happened? Welcome to Drunk Real Estate. Grab a drink and enjoy the show. Hey there, and welcome to episode 21 of Drunk Real Estate. I am Kyle Wilson, Ashley Wilson's husband, and this must be a record. How many how many episodes in a row is this that we're all together? Uh, my co-hosts here, starting with Mr. Jay Scott. How's it going, Jay? Everything is going really, really well. How's everything with you? I can't complain. Dude, you guys have a lot of energy today. What kind of lameness is this? Come on, <laughs> let's pick it up. Kyle and I have been on Zoom since like nine o'clock this morning. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. dude, you got to show oh, up. Dude, Come on, no, bring we're, your we're good. We're good. And and we all know Jay just needs a couple drinks in him. He gets a little giggly. So, what are you drinking, uh, Jay? I'm I'm channeling my my uh, Mauricio tonight with a little bit of white wine. I'm doing an Italian Toscana 2019 white, a uh, little bit dry, a little bit sweet, and uh, I think I can get through uh, more than half the bottle tonight. So yeah, I'll be giggly by the time we're done. Well, let's get there. Mauricio, how's it going over there? What's going on? I am ready. I am pumped. I'm ready to go. Yeah. You drinking tonight? I am, but first and foremost, I've got my uh, planter salted cocktail peanuts that I know you really, really enjoy that I uh, munch on these during the podcast. But no, I actually switched over a little bit. I did a little, little U-turn here. I'm drinking a Stone Fear Movie Lions, 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 double IPA from Stone Brewery, which is a beautiful, great brewery down here in Escondido, California. One of my favorites. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, it's Stone. Okay, well, he's had his plug for the night. Dude, <laughs> we, should get a, we should get a sponsor deal on that one. That was awesome. <laughs> and those those uh, double IPAs they're not uh, they're not light either right that's got to be what seven eight percent yeah this is like probably three glasses of wine that's heavy Ooh. if I had a hat it'll be backward it would be backwards already already all right AJ I left you to last I know you I, you got a grumpy look on your face when I didn't go to you so what's uh how's it, how's it going over there I'm back in the office so I am going with the fountain drink. Now that I'm in the office, I'll do a little fountain diet coke tonight. You know, Just straight crazy. aspartame, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> Gotta love it. Get it going. What are you drinking, Kyle? Oh yeah, I forgot. I am I'm going back to another one, but a really good one. I'm doing the uh the Calumet small batch. Just that 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 little step up of above the uh the original Calumet. So Kyle, do you drink scotch? I do. I just I prefer bourbon over scotch. Oh. I'll, I'll join you one of these days with a scotch. Yeah, let's do it. So this is what we need to do. And AJ gets out of this. He, he's the lucky one. Uh, we each need to send the other two something, and we all need to drink the same thing and just surprise each other. Fair. You can't you can't mail alcohol. I can't mail any alcohol. You can get it chipped from the uh, brewery or distillery. I, I, God damn it, Mauricio. Like, I thought this was going to be like, oh, you're going to crack out the snacks halfway through, but like you're already eating and talking to your <laughs> muffle. Like, this is it. like... <laughs> oh, uh, God, this is awful. Uh, okay, we're starting a little late here, so let's just get going with it. Uh, let's talk about that Wall Street Journal article. Um, so with mortgage rates at the highest level in decades, it's getting harder for people to afford buying a home. So the article in the uh, Wall Street Journal just came out with the headline reading, there has never been a worse time to buy instead of rent. 
And but, you know, some people are saying after double digit rent increases during COVID, is that actually the case? So I wanted to start with your opinion, Jay. A lot of people are saying that once the Fed pauses, there should be a huge drop in mortgage rates for potential buyers out there. Should they just be waiting for a Fed pause or uh, is it okay to be buying right now? Yeah. So, I, I mean, before I jump into answering that question, I mean, you brought up the the Fed rate pause and, and we're not really doing an economic update this week, but it is worth mentioning that, that Jay Powell um, held a little press conference a couple days ago and basically sent the signal that uh, they're, they're not going to hike certainly next week, um, but almost certainly aren't going to hike for the rest of this year, which I guess the rest of this year just means next week in, in December. Um, so uh, we're probably looking at a pause, at least for the next couple months. Uh, who knows where we go after that? I guess if there's some some data that indicates they should be doing something else, raising or, or, or dropping uh, rates, then I guess maybe they'll do something different. But barring anything um, really drastic in, in, in the data, uh, it looks like we're currently at a Fed rate pause. Hey, um, if I had a sound machine, I'd be doing the the cheering and celebrating. <laughs> yeah, but but here's the thing. I mean, anybody that's been watching the the Treasury bond uh, yields over the last couple of weeks knows that um, even though we haven't been raising interest rates, uh, Treasury yields have been going up, and that's what drives mortgage rates. And so um, it's possible that we could have a, a Fed rate uh, pause and still see mortgage rates continue to go up. If treasury yields go up, we, we hit eight a couple of days ago, 8% mortgage rates. And so hopefully it doesn't go much higher, but I'm not convinced that, that the Fed pausing uh, interest rate hikes is necessarily going to impact uh, mortgage rates in a positive way, at least not yet. So, but let, let's, let's jump into your question, which was renting versus buying. Um, and so historically, if you look at the data, um, we have a pretty efficient market between renting and buying. The cost of the monthly cost of renting versus paying your mortgage um, is historically pretty comparable. And that makes sense. I mean, people, if they see it, one of them is going to be a lot more expensive than the other, then they're going to do the thing that's cheaper. They're going to lean towards renting if, if buying is more expensive and vice versa. And so the market kind of uh, kind of fixes itself when things get too far out of whack. And I do want to bring up real quickly um, this chart to give an idea of basically where we've seen things over the past um, the past 30 years uh, in terms of renting versus buying. And so what you'll see here is um, if you start back around 1996, which is as far back as this chart goes, for about seven years, 96 to 2003. Hey, before, before, buy, what, Jay, what, why don't you describe what, you're, what we're looking at for those who are not watching? Yeah, uh, sorry. So this is a chart that basically shows um, the relative cost of renting and buying. And so um, on the on the y axis um, is percentage numbers, and the higher the percent there is the the more it costs to to um, to own than it does to rent. And so at zero, they're the same. And above that, that zero line, it costs more to own. And so between 1996 and 2003 or so, uh, we hovered right around that zero line. Uh, essentially, it cost about the same to, to rent versus buy. And then we led up to the 2008 recession. And we all know what happened with home prices leading up to, to 2008. They skyrocketed. And, and as you can see, um, the cost of home ownership went well above the cost of renting uh, between 2003 and, and 2006. In fact, uh, at in 2006, I guess the end of 2006, we were in an all-time high disparity between renting and buying. It was it cost 32% more uh, or 33% more to, to own a home than it was to rent. And that was just a, a crazy disparity. And then we had the 2008 recession and home prices plunged and interest rates went down. And so owning a home became really a, lot, a whole lot cheaper because you could buy it for a lot less. Your mortgage was a lot less because interest rates were low. And so by like 2012 or so, what we saw was that it was actually like 25% cheaper to rent than to buy. And so by 2018 or so, we, we got back up to that normal line. Markets kind of fixed themselves. And so by 2018, again, it was pretty much the same price to, to rent or buy. And, and that stayed basically the same. Renting and buying was, was comparable until the very beginning of 2022. And we all know what happened at the beginning of 2022. Last year, we saw mortgage rates go through the roof. 
And we know that that housing prices have gone through the roof the last couple of years. So between housing prices going up and mortgage rates going up, basically the cost of home ownership has skyrocketed. And if you remember 2006, we saw the biggest disparity, 33% more expensive to own than to rent. Well, right now we're at 52% more expensive to own a house than to rent a house. So I think it's, it's even just, getting worse than that. I think the one I saw was over 60, 60 points. I was going to say, does this include, is this just the payments or does this also include maintenance and you know, all that other, all the other cost of homeownership? So th- this is just the monthly cost. This is, this is uh, monthly rent versus monthly mortgage payment. Got it. Um, and so, um, and this was, this is from uh, CBRE just came out a couple days ago, wall street journal, picked it up a couple other outlets. And so 52% more expensive to rent than to buy. Now the 60% number Kyle, uh, may have been, uh, over the last three years, both renting and buying have gotten more expensive. That's no surprise. We've seen inflation and, and prices go up. Renting's gone up 22% in the last three years. Buying has gone up over 60%. Yeah, so the one I'm last- looking at is from realtor.com and it compares the uh, home purchase costs. So I think it's, it might factor in other costs as well versus just the cost of rent. Yeah, so so just the just the 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 monthly costs, uh, uh, mortgage versus rents, fifty two percent higher to own. So in theory, this is the, this is where it gets interesting. So in theory, why does this matter to us as investors? Obviously, it matters to people who want to buy houses or uh, or who are renting. But why does this matter to us as renter uh, as landlords? Um, it, it actually it matters a lot because in theory, this should be really good for us in in, in an efficient market. These two should even out. So if, if if home prices are really high and renting is really low, we should, in theory, see them meet in the middle, which means rents should go up or should be going up right now to kind of uh, meet home prices. Maybe home prices come down, but again, meeting somewhere between the two points. But we're not seeing that. And so there, there's a few reasons why we're not seeing that. Number one, um, nobody wants to sell their house. Um, I think we've talked, I, AJ threw out some stats, I think last week or the week before that, that like 65 or 80% of people have mortgages below 4% and almost everybody has mortgages below 6%. So nobody's selling their house. So basically nobody is deciding to sell their house and then move into a rental. So that's number one. Number two, we have supply coming online. Maybe not as much supply as, as we originally thought, but there's building going on and, and there's, there's, there's more supply coming online. And so with the same number of renters, more supply, we're seeing a softening in rents. Um, and then finally, we saw a lot of people moving over the last couple of years. So uh, typically you see um, people moving, renters moving every two years or so. Like good rule of thumb if you own apartment complexes is that your apartment complex is going to turn over every two years. All your, all your units or most of your units will turn over every two years um, because people move out on average about once every two years. Well, the last couple of years, what we've seen in the rental market is people moving an average of four or five months. There was just so much movement, but that's kind of stopped. People have settled. Um, since COVID. And so we're not seeing a lot of movement. So between people settling, um, homeowners not moving, and this this glut of supply coming online, basically landlords aren't seeing the rent hikes that they've seen over the last couple of years. And we're just settling in to this major, major, major gap between homeownership rates or homeownership costs and rental costs. And so the question is, who are the winners and losers in this moving forward? And and my take is, and I'm just guessing here, um, but I think as long as interest rates stay where they are until mortgage rates start to come down, we're not going to see homeowners move. And homeowners, people who are currently in their houses, the people, the 65, 80% of people that have mortgages below 4% and 6%, they're going to be the winners because they're going to continue to pay these fixed rates, these fixed monthly costs, which is going to be a good bit less than what rent is these days. Um, and landlords are going to continue to lose because there's going to be more inventory coming online. We're going to see fewer people moving out of their, their houses, fewer people selling their houses and moving into rentals and people just, again, aren't moving. And so I think for the foreseeable future, landlords are going to lose this one. Now, once interest rates start to drop, I think it's going to go the other way. Once interest rates start to drop, um, homeowners are going to win in two ways. Number one, they're going to be able to sell their houses again because houses are going to be more affordable to new buyers. So they're going to be able to cash out with a big payday. Um, But number two, a lot of those homeowners, I have a feeling, are going to move into rentals because they're going to sell their houses. And instead of buying another house with, with 
mortgage costs 50% higher than renting, a lot of them are going to choose to rent to save money every month. And so homeowners- The question is why, like, why are they, why are the rates coming down though? So like, is it, is like, if we just see some sort of soft landing and they start curtailing it just a little bit, we're not going to see significant rate um, decreases, but- for to me for to actually see any meaningful change and to see a, a shift in people's um habits and buying we're gonna have to see a significant rate drop and, and to me that means a recession happens so doesn't that throw a wrench in that whole thing well yeah and that's what i'm saying at some point i think rates are going to come down um but we don't know if that's going to be three months from now three years from now or whatever i mean it could be a while and I think until that happens, we're going to see this disparity. I don't think there's going to be much efficiency in this market. And I think it's just going to be really expensive to own. And I don't think we're going to see rents increase tremendously until we see those rates drop. Now, Mauricio thinks that, that we're probably heading towards a recession in the next month or two. Um, I think the rest of six us days. agree. He's got six days left. He's got That's right. Six days left in, 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 the, uh, in the month. Um, he said October. Um, the rest of us all kind of agree that it's coming. But is it going to be this year? Is it going to be the first part of next year? Is it going to be the later part of next year? We don't know. Um, so I, I think longer term, this is good for landlords. Landlords will benefit once rates start to come down because people are going to move out of their houses. They're going to sell their houses and they're going to start, a lot of them are going to start renting um, because it's so much cheaper. And so we'll see the cost of owning come down. We'll see the cost of renting go up. They'll meet somewhere in the middle and landlords are going to win long term. But short term, I, I'm not confident that this is going to be good for us. So there's a lot of assumptions that were in that brilliant presentation from Jay. And I'm not saying those assumptions are good or bad or correct or not, but there's obviously a bunch of other assumptions that we could put in there that would result in a completely different um, outcome. And, I, and I'm obviously, I think, I think Kyle and I are kind of on, maybe on timing, we're a little different. And, and right now it looks like Kyle might be ahead of me on this one. But, you know, I, I, I was going to make the point where I think, Kyle, you were gone, which is, you know, I believe that the Fed is going to be doing exactly what it's telling us it's doing. Like if you listen to the Fed and you read the Fed minutes and you watch the Fed and do its press conferences, it has no intention. If it was up to the Fed, if Fed had complete control, which by the way, I think a lot of people give it way too much control or more control than it should, they would like to keep rates higher for longer. Yes, we paused. That's great. But if you're under the impression that now beginning of next year or middle of next year, the Fed's going to slowly start reducing uh, they're already starting to talk about wanting to keep the rates higher for longer. You just got to listen to what they say, right? So if you're listening to them, you've got to assume that rates are going to stay. Maybe they come down a tad, but little they're going to stay at this level for, hey, survive till 25, right? For, for at least a little bit longer. The question is, can they do that, right? And so I think where Kyle and I are coming in is that when there is a recession coming in something happens during that time that's when the fed's going to have to pivot and they're going to re they're going to bring the rates down but not because they want to but because they have to and that's their job their job is a lender of last resort so if the s if the s hits the fan then they have to pivot that's their job they're going to start pumping liquidity and they're going to start reducing rates that'll bring mortgages down but that's not necessarily a great environment for renters or, or, or homeowners to have yeah interest rates are great they're coming down from eight percent down to five percent or whatever great but we're also in the middle of a recession. We're also, you know, unemployment's going through the roof. Remember, just because interest rates are down doesn't mean that you have access to the loan. Remember back in the great financial crisis, interest rates were like zero, but nobody could get a loan. It's, it doesn't really matter that interest rates are at 2% if you can't qualify for a loan because you need a FICO score of, you know, 1300 or something, right? So that's the first point. And then the second point, I'll take a little bit of, a, 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 of an opposing view, in, or not an opposing view, but I think, Jay, you mentioned, you know, the only way that homeowners are going to leave their low mortgages or if the interest rates come down, I think they're going to leave their interest rates when unemployment doubles or triples or whatever from where it is now, because that's what the Fed's trying to do. And now people are unemployed. Guess what they're going to have to do? Sell their homes. Not because they want to, right? But because they're unemployed, they don't have a job. They can't refinance. They can't tap into their equity because they're out of a job. What are they going to do? They're going to have to sell. So there's going to be a flood of inventory at that point. I think we've argued in the past whether that's a sufficient, significant amount of inventory that's going to move the needle or not. I think it is, but that's something we can debate. Well, one of the problems you have, though, with unemployment is unemployment does not evenly affect. So like a lot of people say, oh, unemployment will cause home ownership to drop. But when you look at the makeup of employment, the first layer of unemployment doesn't hit homeowners. These are people that are actually not homeowners, right? By the time you get to homeowners, we're in a 
bad spot. And two, if you look at employment and pricing on homes, there's no correlation, meaning unemployment's gone up and down, up and down, and that doesn't affect home ownership. Why? Because it's such a small percentage of the market. Even if you had unemployment rise double from here, first of all, how many of those are homeowners will be small, but lots of times those layoffs and everything are isolated within certain markets. And so like we saw in 2001, California was hit with huge amounts of unemployment because of the dot uh, com bubble. But that didn't mean that national home prices were affected or went down. So I think that we, you know, when you look at that home ownership number and even with interest rates, I'm in line with uh, you, Mauricio. First of all, the Fed does not want lower interest rates. It, like the Fed, if, when you get to interest rates that we've seen, the Fed's hands are tied behind their backs on what they can do. That's actually a very dangerous spot for the economy to be in because they have, they've lost their ability to spur the economy. So if you get in trouble and you're giving, you have interest rates as low as they were, the Fed's like, how do we spur the, the economy? They, they want that buffer, right? And in order to keep banks healthy and everything, you need, you need interest rates. So the Fed doesn't want it. And also too, uh, there's a lot of people that assume, oh, well, we're going to sell or we're going to get back into the housing market right? When interest rates go back down to three and a half, four percent 4%, but that may never happen. Like ever. That's a phenomenon in the last 10 years. Historically speaking, that's never occurred. I'm not saying that it won't, but I'm saying that's, if you have that assumption, that's like uh, all the millennials that said, oh, I'm going to wait to buy a home until the housing market crashes like it did in 2008. And then all of a sudden in 21 and 22, they're all like, I should have bought a home. And, you know, why can I do it? Because it was, that's such a weird phenomenon. So I think that when we look at the interest rates in the home markets, it's what you would have thought would actually drop prices because of all the reasons that we stated hasn't. And I don't know how much of a drop we will even see in the coming future years, right? And homeowners, they need a place to live. All these millennials, they got to have a place to live. They want to be homeowners. I think homeownership in America will remain lower, though. So I don't think we might not ever go back to the height of homeownership levels that we saw. It may be lower, but that's actually probably a good thing because we don't have the houses for it. Yeah. So in, unless you deal with this huge supply problem and this generational need to buy homes, if interest rates go lower, of course, that'll spur buyers. It always does. The cheaper it goes, the more people can get in, the more people can afford. So you get more layers of society that can actually afford it, right? But if you don't have that, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be in that that place that all of a sudden on your drop. Let's be clear about home ownership because I think a lot of people don't realize this. I'm sure you do, AJ, but for anybody that's listening, I have a, a chart up for anybody that's listening that's or that's not watching um, that basically tracks home ownership rates back to about 1960. And basically what we see is the very low is somewhere around 63% home ownership rate. The very high is somewhere around 69%. So, I mean, it's a very narrow band of 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 home ownership rate. Now, don't get me wrong. The difference between 63% home ownership rate and 69% is, is huge in terms of an economy. Um, but in terms of like the number of people this affects, it's relatively small. And I actually hadn't looked at this in a while, but we are, are right now kind of right in the middle there. We're at 66%. Um, so we're like right in the middle of the, the two extremes for home ownership rate, which is interesting um, because I, I don't know what you guys would expect for, for home ownership rate to be right now. Um, but um, I, I would certainly think that it would be a little bit lower than than the historic average, just given what's going on in the market. But I guess this is is reflective of the fact that that people are locked in. And, and it is interesting to see that for what it looks like the last two years on this chart, like it's basically a flat line, like the homeownership rate hasn't changed. People aren't moving, people aren't selling, people aren't buying. And I would expect to see kind of this flat line over the next several years. So the question is going forward, two scenarios as if you're a home purchaser so someone who's looking to buy a home do you see a light at the end of the tunnel 
And the next question is, as an investor, like if you're in some of these markets where you see this huge disparity between the cost of owning a home versus the cost of renting, if you flip that on the other side, if you're an investor looking to purchase a home that you want to rent out, obviously those numbers aren't working. Like we're, we we looked at our area and basically the break even number, even if you got an interest only loan around here is about a 1% rental rate. And that's, that's to break even. And like it used to be like the 1% rule was like, oh, that was the key of being a really good deal. Right now you're not even breaking even on that. So I, I guess is going forward, obviously we've we've disproven the whole, as AJ said, the um, let's wait for the market to crash and we're going to pick up all these houses then. Um, unless that's your plan, like where's the light at the end of the tunnel? When are we waiting until? Exactly. If you wait, okay, so let's say you, you want to wait till interest rates go down and that's five, six years from now. But properties continue like they have and increased on average with the great uh, with the financial crisis and everything since uh, 1997. That's a seven percent increase a year. All of a sudden, you're six years into it and interest rates go from seven to five or even four and a half. Are you better off? But do you do you think the housing prices are going to increase? Because that's a good question there, too. Like if you're deciding between renting and buying, that's the thing that matters. That's it. If it's going to go up, you should buy. The equation's easy if you think the housing prices are going to continue to rise because then you're then you're just getting into the standard old leverage. You know, you're putting twenty percent down, and even if it raises the the increases by three percent on average, then you only put twenty percent down, so you're getting four times as much of the benefit. Like that's that's easy math. I think if you're buying a house, if you're buying a house, you should look for a place that you can live and you can afford reasonably. If you're investing in small uh, houses, small multifamily, but really we're talking about uh, just normal houses, then you should simply look at the yield and the cash flow that you're going to get off of that rent as that investment goes. And for most people, meaning well over 95% of everyone, you should not worry about that equity portion because you can't control it. And so I think that gambling with where you want to live or raise your kids and things like that on whether housing prices are going to go up and down. I just don't think that's a winning strategy. No, I agree with that. I think it's a big difference of if you're investing versus buying, although your statement, AJ is like, you should live where, you know, something that you can afford. That's, that's the issue, right? It's like, you know, like you want to live in a particular area because of the schools or whatever. And you you look at what you can afford. It's, it's, it's a, a fraction of what you could afford if you were renting. And that's the issue, right? Like you want to live in a nice neighborhood, nice, great schools, you know, a nice little house. And, and, and for the same price to go buy, you're living in a two bedroom apartment, you know, in the same area. And you, and you want to, you want a house, you want a backyard for the kids, you want a dog. And so it just makes it really tough for a lot of people. I was just saying, a lot of this boils down to the assumptions we're making. And I think we're, we're disagreeing on some assumptions. Um, I don't think we're going to see a 2008 type downturn. Mauricio, you mentioned like when unemployment doubles or triples. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you, you, you just threw that out there, but, but for anybody listening, there's a huge difference between employment doubling and tripling employment doubling is a standard recession. I mean, 7% unemployment is, is pretty standard. Um, employment, unemployment tripling, from this point, nine or ten percent, um, that's that's a pretty severe recession. So that would make a big difference if we see employment unemployment. Right, and that's, that was my triple. point with the assumptions. Everybody's assuming it's a soft landing. Everybody's assuming it's a mild to recession. But I'm like, what if you? I mean, there, there's there's a non-zero chance that the Fed overcorrects and wants unemployment to go up and says, I'd like it to be at five and six, just like the 10 year now. And it gets to five and six. Yay. And it's like, oh, crap, it's six and a half and seven. And it keeps growing. They can easily lose control. Um, one of the reasons I don't think the interest rates can stand I me, mean, I was just looking at, I heard this over the weekend. I was at a, this great event in LA. Um, you know what our largest, you know, one of our largest budget items right now, as you know, is, is defense. We spend about $760 billion a year on defense. Our interest payment on the debt, our interest rate payment on the debt just hit 659. Washington Post says U.S. payments on debt spike doubling in two years. And so that's what results when you keep interest rates high. I mean, that's just a strain on the U.S. financial system that it just can't sustain for two, three, four years. That number is going to keep going because that doesn't truly reflect the current interest rate. It just takes a while for those for those securities, those in, those notes to turn over and get to the actual number. But if we held interest rates where they are now for three or four years, we're going to be paying a trillion dollars. I mean, we, our debt's like, thir- I've lost track, $33, $34 trillion. It goes up like a trillion dollars every weekend or something. So when your interest rates are double what they were a year ago and that's sustained 
for another two or three years, you're, you're going to end up spending a third of our receipts on just interest on the debt. And that's another reason I think it just, it just can't, not that the Fed wants to reduce the rate, they're just going to be forced to because something's going to break or just the government's not going to be able to operate at these. Well, in history rates. supports that, right? Because like on average, there's only like five and a half months between the last rate hike and the first cut. And if you even if you look at the only the last, I think, uh, 10 or something, then it's or last five, uh, five times that they raised hikes, then it was uh, it's only 10 months. So like this whole higher for longer for years would be kind of like unprecedented. Like it would be like a, a an outlier, an anomaly. So for us to be using that as a base case, I think is like, to me, is, is very surprising. My, my, my whole take on the higher for longer doesn't mean they're going to keep rates higher even in the face of a softening economy. Um, I interpreted that to mean that they're not going to lower rates just for the hell of it once inflation stops. They're going to wait until they have a need to, to to lower it, and I don't think it's going to be. I don't think it's going to take a 2008 type event before they start lowering rates. I think even a mild recession, um, the Fed has kind of proven that they're they're averse to that these days. But and, haven't they always um, said that their plan was that, like once they've kind of tackled inflation, that they will bring those rates down to a more what, what what's the word they use like that normal but in more like um, neutral neutral. They want to bring it back down to the neutral rate. Neutral policy. Yep. Well. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, we, we kind of got off topic and, and so, but. Yeah, let's it, move on because otherwise it's going to be the same as last week where I have this brilliant presentation for you guys and we're going to run out of time because you guys can't, you know, keep it short. Jay goes on for hours. Well, let's do you now oh. then, Mauricio. We'll put you, we'll slot you in second so you don't get skipped. Um, so hopefully we can skip AJ's at the end. Um, <laughs> hey, hey. We're, uh, we're, we're talking about syndications here. Um what do you know? We have a syndication attorney. Um, so with interest rates remaining stubbornly high and sale prices plummeting, there are a lot of syndicators out there who have been put in tough positions. We've seen foreclosures, fire sales, capital calls. Um, all these things have already happened, but sometimes it's even worse if syndicators just kind of put their head in the sand and they try to avoid these options and hope everything's going to get better. So um, Mauricio, I know you work with a ton of syndicator clients. Um, some of them are inevitably having tough times right now. What are kind of some of these things that you're telling them to avoid doing or saying or in order to stay out of trouble? Yeah, so I think the question came up. I think somebody on in, in our in our in our um, not Slack in our WhatsApp app was talking about you know what what are the things that syndicators can do that ends you know they end up in jail or they end up really being non compliant and and I'll keep this short because it's not a pretty topic and, and all that good stuff. But w one of the things I really wanted to point out, and it's kind of the, I'll, I'll do it right at the beginning. And when it comes to raising capital and you're, you're raising money for your deals and deals aren't going well, you've got to remember that there's two completely separate concerns that you should have, right? So, so one of the concerns is, did you raise the money at the beginning properly, fully compliant with federal and state securities laws, right? So when you're raising the money, did you comply with the thing? Did you do everything properly there? And that analysis happens at the time of sale. At the time that you sold that security, we've got to make sure that you have complied with everything there. And if you didn't, that's where we, we'll talk about in a second some of the things you might have done that would be non-compliant or end up in jail or you know, all that stuff, right? Separate from that is once you've actually raised the money and you start operating, well, now you've, you're running a business, right? So now you have other obligations. Forget about securities law. You just have to operate your business. You've got to operate your apartment or whatever, whatever asset class in, you know, in a reasonable, prudent manner, like a reasonable operator. And so that, those are different issues. So I just want to, I want to emphasize those two things because they happen at different points in time. So let's talk about the first one, which is really where I'm usually involved with my clients, which is you know, what are my obligations or where, how can I get in trouble really at the point of sale? So think about this. This is something that probably happened two years ago, three years ago, 10 years ago. Whenever you actually raise the money, that's when this, this, these issues pop up. So obviously one of them, which is I will definitely land you in jail, is if you're actually out there committing fraud or intentional misrepresentations, right? If you're telling investors that, you know, you're going to be doing X, Y, Z and you have no intent of doing that, or it's a Ponzi scheme or, you know, whatever, you're just out there to, to defraud people. And that's the one time that you should be considered about ending up in a yellow or an orange jumpsuit, because that's really where you have the issues of the criminal liability, which ends up you in being in jail. But most of us, I think, at least don't start off <laughs> with the intent to defraud and intent to, to, to intentionally misrepresent. Represent. I think where most people, most people's issues are in the failure to disclose camp, right? So not 
completely telling and being upfront with your investors about your potential conflicts of interest or your compensation or anything that you really should have disclosed to your investors. Again, at the time of the sale, not now when things aren't going well. We're talking about two or three years ago when you raised the money. Were you upfront with everyone? Did you disclose all of the material facts, all of the important information that was important for an investor to go into the investment with their eyes wide open? Because if you didn't, if you f f failed to disclose something, or maybe more importantly, omitted something, meaning you left something out of your documents or your disclosures that, that, that otherwise would have made what you did tell the investors misleading. Right? That's another thing. So it's either a failure to disclose, misleading somebody, or omitting a, a material fact that, that really changes the context of your initial disclosures. Um, Mauricio, that, yeah. to, to, to interrupt you real quick, um, and I have this, this isn't just for the audience, it's for me as well. Um, can you give us an idea of what's a material fact versus not a material fact? Yeah, so I mean, the, the technical, I don't know if it's a technical definition, but it's really any piece of information that your investors would consider important to them in making that investment decision. And of course, that's a very, as you can tell, it's a very, I'm using this word nebulous a lot. I'm not even sure that's the right word. I think it is. I like the word, so I'm going to keep using it. But it's this nebulous term because I can argue that this was material. You could say no. The regulator can say something else. I mean, you can really argue at it at any, really at any angle, at any degree. I mean, I can say almost anything's material. You might say, hey, I was just changing managers. I don't think that was really important. But if you're a plaintiff's lawyer that's representing an investor who lost all their money, I guarantee you they're going to be like, oh, no, no, no. If it wasn't for you, if you had told me that this manager came in and that and therefore the person that I was relying on has less control, then there's no way my client would have invested in the deal, right? And that's why we're so, I would say conservative, but we're like overly cautious and making sure that we're, 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 we're leaning on the cautious side. Like if it's ever in dispute, like if you even have to ask the question, we're putting it in there. Like why, why not? Like why is it something that we would, we would shy away from? Because anybody can make those arguments and whether it's the SEC or the state regulator that makes the argument, or again, you're also thinking of the plaintiffs. And when I say plaintiffs, the investor's attorney. Because remember, if the investors lost all their money, right, they're going to hire a plaintiff's attorney and they're going to come at you at all different angles. And so why give them an opportunity to make an argument that, hey, you, you didn't disclose this when I can easily argue all day long. I don't have to even prove anything. I can just put it in my complaint and, and, and now I've got to deal with it. Uh, and what they're going to argue is like, if you had told me, Jay, Whatever, whatever information, if, if you had told my client, the investor, about this, 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 the, my client would not have invested with you. And therefore, that caused my, the, the loss. And so that's why I just over, I don't say over disclose. Like if, if, you ha if you have to ask about it, it's probably material, right? And so I, I just like to over disclose everything, uh, especially when it comes to things like compensation, whether direct or indirect compensation, certainly conflicts of interest and stuff. Um, that's what, what, if, yeah. what if it's stuff like... Um, there's an Amazon plant down the street that like you get a bunch of your tenants from potentially. Um, and there's talk about the Amazon plant closing the warehouse closing. I mean, is that material? I, um, I don't know. That's a very, very specific. I, I, I'd want to figure out all the other stuff. I mean, um, I, I mean, it, it depends on when, is that something that you knew? Is that, I mean, if, if that's something that you and I discussed on the front end about, Hey, the deal, then like, why not? Like, why does it hurt? I mean, I guess I could argue, hey, I didn't know. I guess it also depends on whether you bring it up. If you're bringing up the fact that you've got all these great companies that are surrounding and that's really supporting your tenant base, this is a great location and you, and you, you pump up the idea that, and especially if you named Amazon in there, right? If you, if you reference Amazon in your documents about one of the top employee employers of the, of the area and you use that as kind of your marketing, then I would definitely at that point argue that, hey, if you, if you, if you knew or, or, or thought that that was going to close down, again, I would, I would definitely disclose. Now, if you didn't bring up Amazon anyway, and so the investor didn't even know that was a, a factor in, in making the investment, then again, maybe you can argue, and maybe we'll be successful, but I guarantee you, if I'm representing a plaintiff's attorney, and I find that out, I'm going to throw that in there. It's like, hey, Jay, you should have known that Amazon, a reasonable, prudent person would have known that Amazon potentially closing would have had a devastating effect on this mess investment, and therefore... Had you disclosed that, I wouldn't have invested in it and I wouldn't have lost my money. So, um, but those are kind of the main things at the point of sale. And obviously the, the, the big one where you can get in, into, where you really get into trouble is when you have unregistered offerings, right? You have an obligation as a syndicator to either register your syndication with the SEC or find an exemption. And the biggest issue that most of us have is they just didn't follow the, all the bullet points from the exemption. But again, that happens at the time of sale. That was in the past. 
nothing you can do about that now. We always go back and at the time of sale, did you comply with anything? One is that might- true? There's nothing you can do now? Like, let's say I, I realized, okay, I'm listening and I'm like, oh, Mauricio is, is telling me this. I wish I would have known this. I, I didn't hire an attorney as good as Mauricio when I uh, started the syndication. I didn't know that. Now there's stuff I should have disclosed. What do they do? Yeah. So the, 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 if it was a material fact, right, and you've got concerns and it's already closed now, and let's say it's six months later, a year later, and you, and you realize that you violated securities laws, the only way that, the only thing you can do at that point is, is what's called a rescission letter, which is like, hey, investors, no, you're not going to say it this way, but essentially it's going to be, hey, investors, I screwed up. <laughs> I didn't realize I was supposed to disclose this or, hey, I did this and I shouldn't have done it. And you basically do like a mea culpa letter and you say, hey, we, we, we've in a nice way, we've kind of violated or we may have violated securities laws. We failed to disclose whatever. So here's the disclosure. And if you'd like to get out at this point, you're welcome to. And that's the challenge, right? Because once you've closed and you've already bought the asset, you probably don't have any money, right? So there's no way you can return five, $10 million of, of, of equity. And that's the challenge. But if you did that, if you offered them rescission rights, which usually we do you know, prior to close because you still have the money. But if you offered them a chance to get out, right, and get them their money back plus interest, at that point, even though you violated the securities laws, you know, six months ago or a year ago, there's it's going to be very difficult because from a damages standpoint for them to come back and say, hey, you didn't tell me this and I lost money. You're going to come back and say, yeah, I didn't tell you this, but then I gave you a chance. I told you later and you didn't you, and you decided to keep going and you didn't you didn't get out of the deal. So there's something called a, mis- a rescission letter, which is the only thing that you could do post, you know, because I always say once the cat's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. We can't put it back in the bag. Right uh, now. Another thing to consider too is is is, is there a reason we can't put a cat back in a bag? I mean, it's not like a genie out of a bottle. Well, it's easier to put a cat back in the bag than it is to put a, a genie back in the bottle. Or that's vice my versa. point. You're using yeah. you're using the wrong metaphor there. That may be. It depends on the bottle too. It depends on the how the bottleneck and how big it is. And, and how the small cat it is. in the bag. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah, fair. Uh, but that's the biggest thing. Is just the, is the, is you could do the rec- and the other thing that could happen is you could actually draft documents that are actually perfect, literally perfect at the time of sale. But then you do something in the future that makes those documents wrong. So, for example, a, a sort of a um, not a big deal in terms of like nothing fraudulent. But let's say you have a deal where you're raising a fund and you say, I'm going to go invest in self-storage facilities. Right. And that's and you give all the perfect disclosures. Everything's perfect. And then two years later, you decide, yeah, you know what? I also want to do some uh, mobile home parks and you go buy a mobile home park. Right now, you have kind of didn't disclose that out your document, so it's kind of retroactive. Like now your documents that were perfect yesterday suddenly aren't perfect because now you're investing and doing something that wasn't disclosed in the documents at the time of sale two or three years ago. But anyway, so that's the first thing you got to worry about is like, hey, did I do anything wrong at the time of sale? Because what what I want everybody to be, uh, maybe this is the only thing I tell you in terms of feeling better, like once the deal closes and you've acquired the asset, things are going to change. Right. Nothing goes perfectly according to plan. You know, you've got you drew it up a certain way. You have a business plan, but there's things are going to change. And if it doesn't go to according to plan, you may have to pivot from that original business plan. And just because you deviate from that business plan doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Because, again, at the time of sale, everything was accurate and you were disclosing everything properly. The fact that the, you know, the market went down or interest rates went up and you had to start pivoting and you needed to like, you know, I know the plan was to do X, Y, Z, but we have to change course a little bit from our business plan. And, and, and at that point now, we're relying on your expertise as the manager and the operator to, to navigate the investment properly. And, and you shouldn't be worrying about, well, I told the investors I was going to do this and this would be in contravention with that. It doesn't matter. Once you've closed, now we enter into the second realm, which is you're operating, at that point, think of it as a business. Now you're operating this company, right, on behalf of your investors and that's where we have to think about sort of your fiduciary duties. As a sponsor, you have fid- what's called fiduciary duties. And there's really two of them. One is a duty of care, right? Meaning you have to act. Your responsibility as an operator is to act as a reasonably prudent operator would under the circumstances. It's like almost like we pick this mythical person out there, and this is the perfect operator out there. And then the question is, how would the perfect operator have handled this particular situation? That's the standard of care that you are, are held to. And so as long as you meet that standard, even if the results aren't great, if, if you would have done, if you did the exact same thing that this perfect, reasonable, prudent person under the same circumstances would have done, you're going to be just fine. Like even if you lose money, even if things go south, 
if it was unexpected, it wasn't your fault. If a reasonable, prudent person wouldn't have done anything differently, you're going to be good. So you've got that duty of care. And of course, you have that duty of loyalty, which means you always have to put your investors ahead of yourself, right? And whenever you're talking about whether it's compensation or whether I should sell or whether I should refinance, you can't be thinking, man, I better sell now because if I don't sell, you know, I'm going to at least get some money now. But if I wait, the market can go down, like whatever, and I might not get paid enough. It doesn't matter, right? You've got to put your investors first. And you've got to always focus on what is best for the investors themselves, not what's best for you. And that's called the duty of loyalty. Um, and then, of course, the other ways that you kind of goes hand in hand with this duty of care is obviously if you're mismanaging the property or mismanaging the, especially these days, mismanaging the loan. I think that's the main issue we're having these days. If you're mismanaging the loan and didn't quite do the right things in terms of the interest rates and, and the insurance. And again, the question is going to be, what would a pr reasonable, prudent operator have done? Would they have bought cap rates? Would they have done something different? Would they have started shopping the deal earlier? Everybody knew, you know, okay, it wasn't your fault that we we're in this situation, but hey, you waited two years to try and unload the property and you just sat there hoping that the interest rates were going to come down. Well, a reasonable, prudent operator would not have done that under the same circumstances. They would have already reached out to other people, try and get some additional funding, or they would have tried to sell or refinance. They would have done other things that would have saved the project. You're always you're always comparing yourself to that standard, which is that of a reasonable, prudent operator under the circumstances. So, something um, I always find interesting is because I, I, when I talk to other people who I'm kind of um, teaching about like how to, how to syndicate. Um, and I, I often say, look, after the deal closes, just like you said, Mauricio, I, I kind of channel you after the deal closes. Um, nothing's going to go to plan and you just need to make the best decisions in the interest of your investors. Um, but the question is sometimes your what, what one investor would consider to be an optimal decision isn't necessarily what another investor would consider to be an optimal decision. Some investors might be more risk takers and they'd be like, well, yeah, if there's an 80% chance that, that we're, we could, we could still hit a home run on this deal, 20% chance we're going to lose money. Let's take that chance. And other investors might say, well, no, if there's even a 20% chance we're going to lose money, I don't care about the home run. I want just to, to, to be made whole. And so like sometimes that's not clear what a prudent operator would do in that situation because it's, it's not clear what the, what the optimal outcome is without knowing who the investor is and what they want. No, I mean, that's a good point in terms of the investor. Again, we're not worried about, hey, it, it, what, would the investor want this or would the investor that? You're held to the standard. And the way you ultimately, just so you know how it ends up really from a practical standpoint, is if this ever does go to court and there's an argument as to, hey, you didn't, you know, what is the standard? Was it higher? Was it lower? That's when you literally, when you're at trial and you're in a, in a, in a litigation, you're bringing in experts. You are literally, I mean, you guys would be probably prime experts. Like if it, if it was one of my, if I was the operator, I'd be like, let's call AJ because AJ is an expert in self storage. He knows the business inside and out. AJ, what would a what would you do in this situation? What would a reasonable, prudent self storage operator do under this circumstance? And you would be giving your opinion. It's called an expert opinion. So once you qualify as an expert, you would be giving this standard. Of course, the other side, the investors are going to bring in their expert. That's going to probably have a lower barrier, right? And so then then it's just a question of you know who does the jury believe? Do they believe AJ that he, he that's the right standard, or they believe this other person who has who said no, I would have done it differently. And that's where you go into a level of experience. And, and honestly, you know, do you just convince the jury or the trier of fact, you know, who do they believe more? And, and they will then they will decide what the correct standard was based on whatever either AJ said or John Doe says over here. They'll decide who they believe more or give more credibility to. And that's what establishes that that standard of care. Makes sense. Um, and the last thing I would just be cautious too, because this, this does come up these days because there's an inclination to, you know, you get a lot of people, investors who are complaining. There's a lot of squeaky wheels, right? There might be one or two investors that tend to be calling you every 10 seconds and other investors that are cool about it. Uh, you just can't give people preferential treatment, right? That's something that, that we need to keep in mind. You can't suddenly just say, hey, this person's been bugging me. Let me just get this person out. Like I'll pay them, you know, I'll just give them their money back. And you, you can't give somebody, especially if things aren't going well, you certainly don't want to be giving anybody preference. So you, you have an obligation to treat all of the investors equally uh, within a class. Sometimes we separate the classes, right? And there might be a preferred class versus another class. So everybody within that class needs to be treated equally. Do not start giving people preferential treatment, giving some people distribution, some not, or maybe, or, or even worse, getting some people out without offering that same thing to everybody. Because as you can imagine, if somebody, if the deal isn't going well and somebody wants their money back and you give it to them, 
well, what about the other 43 investors? Why didn't you give those money out? So that could, that could lead to some issues for you as well if you're starting to give some preferential treatment to some investors over others. One of my big um, things that comes up is is communication. And uh, I guess it's where where do you draw the line before between professionalism and kind of shadiness in the sense that uh, in one particular I'm in, I'm in an LP investment in a, in a in a fund right now and I know it's not going well and the operator just completely ghosted won't return any calls won't return any emails just won't respond at all and to the point where there has to be like a legal um filing in order just to compel them to respond to us um where kind of where is the line drawn there where it's kind of, it's not really like communication is not really one of those like okay that's not fraud if they're just not saying anything but is it is it better to over communicate communicate a little bit or you know in in the case of an operator like if things aren't going well is there any problem with you know this guy who's just absolutely not communicating at all no, I mean, let, let's separate two things. Let's talk about best practices and, and maybe what the legal requirement is. And, and, I, and I, I want to give credit to, to Ken McElroy, who's, who's the one who first talked about this. And, but we all agree on this. It's like, you know, communication is key and communication builds trust too. So nobody likes to listen, to hear bad news, but it's much better to be communicating that bad news often and early versus sticking your head in the sand and you can't get a hold of somebody. And so, you know, I did a video not too long ago called about, you know, how to execute the perfect cash call. I think that's how I called it. And it starts with communication. Like you should, if things aren't going well, you should be doubling, if not tripling your communication with your investors. If you're ordinarily communicating once a quarter, that's your usual thing. Well, now maybe it's once a month or maybe it's once a week or hell, if it, if it warrants it daily, like the communication shouldn't be the issue. And, and there's, there's no scenario. And I know it's happened sometimes. There's no scenario. And this would definitely fall below this reasonable, prudent manager standard. But there's no scenario that you should wake up one day and, and realize that you're going to foreclosure tomorrow or, or there's suddenly there's a cash call that came out of nowhere. Like, you just need to be communicating early where you can see that, hey, distributions are stopping. Things are, you know, hey, I've got this increase that's coming up in six months. I mean, the investors should really be knowing what's going on. And so from, that's the kind of the best practices. I'm sure I'd love to hear your, your, your guys' point of view as, as operators. But from a legal standpoint, you just there's two things to look at. One is that standard. So if it ever gets to the point of going to a trial or something, AJ, I'm picking on you, AJ. AJ is going to show up as the expert witness saying, hey, look, guys. The, the standard practice in the industry is when things aren't going well, you've got to start communicating once every week or once every two weeks or whatever the standard is that, 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 that is in the industry. And then the question is going to be, did this particular operator fall below that standard? And if they did, they've fallen be below the standard of care. But the other place to look at is the documents. I always talk about the, the, the operating, in this case, it would be the operating agreement or as um, Gary Keller likes to call it, the disagreement, because it's only when you're, there's a disagreement that you actually look at the operating agreement. So, uh, but it's gonna be, there's gonna be oftentimes language in there that dictates how, number one, how often communication is, is happening. It may just say once a quarter, but it also gives you the right to request certain information, certain documents from the sponsor. And so if you make those requests and say, hey, I, I need this report, or I need the, or the financials, or I need this, or I need that, and they're stonewalling, well, now you have another potential claim against them, which is they breached their, uh, the, the op it's a breach of contract, they breached the operating agreement. As the manager, they were obligated to provide you with this information within a reasonable time. You haven't heard from them in two months. So in addition to having that duty of care uh, argument against them, you also have the violation of the, of the operating agreement. And, 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 and one last thing I'll say, and this, is, this might get me into trouble with some of my clients maybe who are, are struggling, but I've always felt that if you say it in a nice way, but I mean, hey, if you don't give me a call by the end of the week, my next phone call is to the state regulator or the SEC. Nobody wants that happening, right? When they've, got, they've already got enough problems going on, right? The last thing they want is, the, is their state regulator breathing down their neck or the SEC breathing down their neck. So that's always like a little bit of a leverage play I think, uh, I think past investors have if, they, if, the, if the operators really are being unreasonable and you think they are. So to your point, they're sticking their head in the sand and they, they, you know, things aren't going well. We don't even know the ca if how the cash call went and whether they're going to be foreclosing or what's going on. And, you know, that, that's always a little bit of leverage that, that I think the passive investors have because uh, that's just the last thing a sponsor wants is, is a call from the, even if they're doing nothing wrong, just having to deal with all that audit and, and getting all that stuff. It's just one more headache that they don't want to deal with. Yeah. It's interesting. I was at uh, the bigger pockets conference last week and, um, and one of the big discussion topics was there's a, uh, 
somebody who is known in the bigger pockets community, a syndicator who recently did a capital call and not that uncommon. I mean, I guess there's a, a bunch of capital calls going on these days, but I talked to literally three, four, five, maybe six people who are invested with, with this person. And basically the, the, the message was every month I was getting updates saying how great everything was and, and how everything was going along well. And then one day I wake up to, Hey, capital call, I need you to send money by the end of the week. And, um, and I don't think anybody suggested that what he had done was illegal. Um, but it certainly was going to, to hurt their perception of, of, of that, that person, um, as somebody they want to invest with in the future. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. There's no, there's no scenario in where one day, one day, and again, they, there may be other claims there too, for example, not, not to give any, anybody ideas, but if you're communicating with the investors and you're mis I mean, to go from everything's great one month to a cash call the next month, I, I'd be taking a look at that communicate that last communication. Cause you know, it, I, I don't know how that works. I mean, usually there's a little bit of a, there's usually a good six month heads up. Like, you know, um, you know, we're running out of money. Our, our, our receivables are low and uh, you know, our interest payments still coming up. I mean, to go from one month, everything's hunky dory to the next month. There's a cash call. I don't know. What do you got? What do you guys, I mean, what are you guys recommending in terms of communication? If things aren't going great in general, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, these are investments and I know that we will have a deal that is going to not turn out anything like we wanted it to because I am not in control of local markets. I'm not in control of so many things, right? And that's why investing, right, is risky. And that's why we state that it is. And I think that, um, you know, you need to look at those investors. You need to look at those investors like partners and say, listen, this is what's happening. The market's turned on us, right? Pretty much every single GP should be having those conversations. Today, if, if you haven't told and talked to your investors that the market has changed, they, I'm sure they have those questions of you. How, do, how is interest rates going from two and a half, three to eight affecting our asset, right? And what is the change in the plan? And how does this look? What does these headwinds mean, right? It, you just, you need to look at them like partners. You need to understand that this is an investment they're risking with you and to talk them through and walk them through it, right? And I don't think that you should have a perception that you need to be perfect, but you do need to be open and honest. And uh, that's okay. And I think that uh, it's hard, right? We Nobody does. I don't. Nobody wants to tell their investors that things are not going well. Why? Because it means so much to us as operators. And with the fact that somebody gave us their money, it's a big deal. And we take that, you know, more important than anything else. We're, we are safeguarding their capital. So yes, it's hard, but also it was their decision to invest and it, you want to be open. And I think that, that that's how you stay out of trouble. I, I really think it's that simple saying, I'm trying everything in my power the local market, whatever occupancies have gone down under anything that we ever measured or foresaw, uh, 8% interest rate, we can't refinance now. That wasn't part of the plan. You knew the plan. We disclosed the plan and that plan's not working out. And I think that being open, honest on what you're trying to do and what the plan is moving forward, like it's hard, but you got to do it. Would you guys put, I mean, this is an interesting because that, we had an interesting discussion over this past weekend and it had to do more with cash calls and we don't need to get to that point. But do you guys, would you guys be recommending if things aren't going according to the original plan to sort of redo the plan? Like, okay, that this is the original plan. Clearly that's not going according to, but we were going to refinance in year two, but that's not going to happen. So here's our updated, let's do a call. Let's talk about our updated plan to show you a, a different path. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, 100%. We're doing that now. We're literally saying, you know, maybe our plan hasn't changed, 
but there is no way that I could legitimately say that the inputs into our models and everything have not changed. You, you should be evaluating, reevaluating your plan every quarter. Like you should be, you should be looking and saying, okay, this was the original plan. Where are we along those lines of the plan? If the plan's going well, then okay, that's fine. Let's move on to the next quarter. The next quarter comes around. If something starts to change and you're like, okay, this isn't going according to plan, you got to say, is it still the best plan? Or there are other options. And once that scale shifts and it's no longer the best plan, that's when you got to call everyone together and say, hey, should we be pivoting here? Yeah. And that was one of the questions that came up on the weekend, which is like, hey, how do I know, you know, especially with these cash calls, it's like, do I, how do I know if I'm going to put more, more money into the deal? Is it just putting good money over after bad? Like what's going on? And that was my point. It's like, you know, you've got to look at the new plan. There's got to be another plan for the cash flow. Hey, here's what we're going to do with the money. And this is why we think we're going to be able to get across the, you know, across this hump. They're presenting you with a new business plan. And what was interesting that I hadn't thought of this before was that unlike the original deal, the original business plan is that they were given all the legal disclosures, right? They're doing a PPM and all the disclosures are happening at that point. But when they're doing the sort of the cash call and here's the updated plan, they don't have those protections. There's no, there's no document. There's no PPM part two that says, hey, here are all the risks of this plan and here are all my assumptions in this plan. Um, so they need to take that into account and just understand what the plan is, what are the assumptions underlying the plan, and try and figure out if it's really something that they believe they're going to be able to execute this now, this second plan, which is going to be different from the original plan. I, I, we got to move on here. So I, I, but I think at the end of the day, if you uh, hire someone like Mauricio who does the proper disclosures and, and sets you up correctly in the beginning, and if you are just being honest and open about everything as you're going forward, everything that's happening, you pick up the phone when somebody calls you, um, then you, you should be okay regardless of how, if you if you hit tough times. So um, you know, let's let's hope that everyone can get through this here. We we don't see too many foreclosures and capital calls, but uh, if you do, um, best practices usually get you there. Um, did I just get Did I just get plugged by Kyle? Is that what just happened? Kyle you plugged did. you. <laughs> did I get plugged? <laughs> We've spent enough time together now that I'm uh, you know I, I comfortable. feel comfortable plugging you. Um, Ashley, right. I'm sorry. It's uh, a- a- AJ's talk times down a little bit so far. So let's give him, let's bring it back up here. Uh, a few weeks back, we talked about how self storage market was softening, and talking about is one thing, but seeing in action is another. So AJ thought it might be beneficial for us to hit up some uh, real world examples with real numbers, and um, and how they've uh, how they've actually come across his desk. So uh, AJ, why don't you uh, enlighten us? Yeah, you know, we we're as we were talking about, times have changed. This is a true across the board in commercial real estate. It's just something we we know. But a lot of times it can be hard to quantify the change. And it's very hard and hard to measure the risk and, you know, kind of what's happening. So we look to, in commercial real estate, we look at our current portfolio, our data that we see. But we're also looking at assets that are trading on the market because we kind of want to see those comps. Like, where is the appetite from buyers and sellers on the market of the asset? And so up until this point, to be honest, we have not seen any price reductions, meaning that everyone knows, okay, it's harder to buy everything else. But instead of seeing like deals coming on that were doing huge uh, cut downs on price, they just weren't trading. So they were going off. So uh, deals were down over 80% on transactions, right? I mean, huge, like deals are just going out of the market, then they're just being pulled off because they don't want to write down their price and that risk. Um, We've been seeing now though, some deals that are starting to come across. Let me, that's outside development. We're seeing developments that are in trouble and being just wiped away all the time. That is shocking what we're seeing on that end. Um, And that has to do with the financing and the capital raising portion of it, because banks do not want to allocate capital, nor do investors into developments right now. So that's been that problem. But um, actual cash flowing assets, we just had a deal that was really interesting because it was a deal we lost out on about two years ago. So we already underwrote it. We looked at it, everything else. And all of a sudden, this deal pops back up on market. This was a very large syndicator, very, very large. And they were on buying sprees in in the self-storage market. And it interested us because they were coming out at basically the same price that they 
purchased it for. Uh, the price that they purchased it for, and I won't name names or anything, obviously, but the price that they purchased it was right around 14 million. We were at 12 to try to make it work. We lost it 14, so we didn't come in close. And uh, um, they're back on the market for 14. We took the exact same numbers, which was interesting because occupancy was lower, although net income was up. But that same property, we can't make work I mean, we're at basically 9 million and that 9 million is the debt they have on it. So when we look at this, we say, first of all, I don't know who's going to be, I mean, who's going to purchase that at that level. Um, we can't imagine that's going to trade at all. But then it asks, then why did they put it on the market? Right? Because this isn't a flipper. This isn't one of those deals. And uh, what we're seeing now is uh, what we believe we looked back at financing everything else as of January 1, that's when the three-year mark is for their debt. So I think what we're now starting to see is three-year interest only and properties that are needing to be refinanced start to come up and people realizing we're, this isn't happening. We're not refinancing this thing at the level we wanted. So let's put it on the market and see if we can just get our money out and break even. Um, this is not the only one. We've seen multiple now of these deals in the last month that we've already underwrote and already saw that are now coming back on the market at pretty much the exact same price. Is that weird though, no. AJ? Because usually when you start seeing these properties back on the market, I mean, the stories in multifamily anyway that I'm hearing is like, hey, you know, this property came on the market last year for $23 million and now it's back at 19, like it's, it's usually coming back at a lower price. Is that something unique in the well, self storage business? This was somebody bought it. It didn't get pulled off the market and not sell. Somebody bought it. Now that person that bought it just two years later, it's now up and they're trying to sell it for exactly what they purchased for it. So the, um, it looks to us like people are now starting to want to release properties and they're trying to get out from under them. And the reason why this is just interesting to us is because the all three properties were like, you know, first of all, why? Because for us and lots of other people, if it's not convenient to sell it, just don't. Just wait, right? Um, but it looks like the, a lot of these properties, they have to. And as time goes on, what you're going to see is you're going to see 20, you're going to see 2020, 2021, right? And then start to see 2022, all of those commercial properties that had those three year interest rates come back up. And unless they got huge amounts of increase in income, which this property did, it was actually higher in income, but it was lower occupancy and rates in that market were down like a lot. So when somebody's looking at that, you're going, this is going the wrong way. So how you sell it at a premium at these interest rates uh, so I think we're starting to see markets shift and uh, sellers we're having discussion with, with now there's more urgency, which I don't know about you guys in your markets. We didn't see any from sellers. If you had a cash flowing existing asset, there was no urgency. We weren't seeing distressed assets hit the market. If it was a cash flowing asset, we were seeing once again, the development deals were all in trouble, but we haven't seen any cracks in those existing assets until just now we're starting to see some properties. Yeah, we, we saw um, somebody that, that we know that is in the multifamily space a couple months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, probably about three months ago, uh, was looking at a deal, had it under contract at 27 million, came to us to kind of put a second set of eyes on it. And uh, Ashley is really good at kind of uh, picking up on on discrepancies and saw some stuff that, 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 concerned her and basically came back and, and told this person that uh, she probably wouldn't pay more than $24 million. Um, and it was a hard decision. He had a several hundred thousand dollars in, in hard money down that he it was non-refundable. Um, he backed out of the deal, um, ended up losing several hundred thousand dollars. Um, the broker came back to him about two weeks ago and said, hey, we'd love to make this deal work again. We're willing to go down to 22 
So keep yeah. in mind, 27 was the the agreed upon number a couple months ago. Um, 24 was what we thought was a, a reasonable price. And now they were offering it at 22. Um, looked at the deal again, and our take was 17 is what it was worth. Yeah. Um, so so certainly um, it, the timeline's it's not- a little, The timeline's a little longer there, Jay. It's not in a matter of months. This was, you know, over the course of the year. But yes, your your numbers are correct in that it was like, that's how, how much it dropped. Yeah. Okay. So I'm misremembering. Just in case we have listeners that, you know, they're either new or something. I mean, it may be worth spending two minutes on this, but you know, th- what AJ was talking about those three-year loans, they really became prevalent right around COVID. Like I forget the exact year, but at some point, and I think it was COVID because the, the prices of the real estate, whether it was multifamily or it sounds like it's the same thing with self, I didn't know that they were doing this in self-storage, but the price of the real estate was going through the roof. And even though rents were increasing, they weren't increasing enough to really make the impact on the NOI. And so people couldn't get traditional loans anymore, not because lenders didn't want to lend 70, 80 percent on these loans, but because the debt service coverage ratio wasn't there, meaning the, the rents from the property wasn't enough to, you know, the, the banks usually want like a one and a quarter, you know, 1.25 ratio. So you have at least 25 percent more, you know, net operating in- income more than your than your debt payment. And so a lot of syndicators or a lot of operators moved because they couldn't make anything pencil with a traditional you know, loan. They would do these, really they're, they're called bridge loans. I don't know if that's a right word or not, but there were these three plus one plus one, meaning there were a three-year short-term bridge loan. And then there were a couple one-year extensions, but they have their, you know, they have their, uh, you know, uh, strings tied to those extensions. They're not automatic and they're, they're, they may be requiring additional monies or some more reserves. And so that might not be an issue, but those three years is, is what really is starting to cause these issues because th- those are obviously short-term ro- loans. It's almost like these, uh, you know, on the financial, on the personal side, back, back in the great financial crisis. But they're they're up against the, the gun, right? They, they they have to they have to they have to do something after three years. And unfortunately, with interest rates where they are now, refinancing just doesn't it just doesn't pencil out. So well, refinancing and the reason talking. behind the name bridge loan is it's supposed to bridge from being a non-stabilized asset to being a stabilized asset, which you can re- refinance. So it's supposed to be a bridge between those two things. But the problem is, to, to your point, that people started getting these bridge loans as their that was their plan. Their plan was to get this bridge loan and then to turn around and sell it in that short period of time, which you know anybody who had that, it, it worked for a few years there and people got pretty rich off of it. But um, then all of a sudden, the, the flaws in that plan are starting to show now. And the reason people would do that is because they have lower interest rates. So like if I if I go and I'm locking up in a 10-year loan, then I have to pay a premium for time. So banks were willing, and banks do, they give the, the shorter amount, uh, shorter time frame in the loan, you get less, you have to pay less interest. Why? Because they know they're going to refinance it. So if there's any adjustment in interest rates, they can pick that up. So all of a sudden, when you're looking at it, you're saying, well, I can get a three-year loan at 3% but I'm paying almost 5% on a 10 year. Well, that doesn't work on cash flow to my investors. I'm going to take the 3% and then I'm just going to refinance it in three years at, you know, 4%, but the NOI will be up more or whatever that is. And that's what the bet was. Yeah. And it's, and it's almost, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same, almost the same concept or the same thing as these adjustable rate mortgages, even though these are not adjustable rate mortgages, the effect is the same. You've got an adjustable rate, but that gets to reset at some point in the future. And if you can't refinance when that payment, when you say, again, when it was residential, your mortgage payment went from $1,500 to $2,200 because it, that adjustment mortgage reset, you were in deep doo-doo. Same thing here. It wasn't a reset, but you, your loan would expire. And now I have to refinance. And now I'm looking at, you know, six, seven, eight percent you know, commercials, you know, whatever it is, seven or eight percent interest rate. It just doesn't work. And so to AJ's point now, we've got to sell it. There's no other option. Well, the problem is not even the payment. The problem is you buy this thing at 14 million and the value was predicated at that. The bank's now underwriting it saying, no, it's not worth anything close to that. So then the bank actually comes to you and says, you need to put $2 million more down because the value's not there. So it's your, your loan to value is off. So you have to, you've got to put money into it. So you can't even just say, well, I'll just take a higher interest rate, even if it takes all the profit or anything. No, you actually got to even put more down. So then all of a sudden people are stuck. 
And that's that. Well, you have two options when, at that point, right? There's, so you have what is the cash in refi, basically, where you can you can put the money in and refi the property, and then basically and then stabilize it. So now, okay, the new as as we talked about in the last segment, the new plan going forward is we are fixed rate debt, and we're we're going to hold on to this, and we're going to hopefully cash flow going forward. Um, you could do a capital call to just kind of paper over it for a little while and hope things go away, or the other. The option, which it seems like is happening in, in your industry now, is people are selling for that loss, which like it's it's a it's a crappy thing to happen. But sometimes that's just the best option. Like if you instead of just doing a capital call, which you're one of those highly publicized foreclosures happened where they actually did a capital call and then got foreclosed upon two months later, like that's a hundred times worse, right? Like where you're, you're doing a capital call and hoping that you're going to solve it and it doesn't actually solve it. Capital calls are only, only work if it solves the problem. And if the, a capital call is not going to solve the problem to me, you almost have to respect somebody who's going to sell this for a loss because it's better to return 75% of your investors money than to return zero in a foreclosure. So, um, like you, you have to look at it from that perspective that if they're having to do this, then maybe that's the best option for them. Oh, absolutely. Just to kind of circle back to my, to my thing, what I was talking about, just because you lose investor money doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. Like if the reasonable, prudent manner, like to your point, if the prudent move, everybody agrees, look, your options were I was going to lose all of my investors money, or I was going to lose 70, you know, 30% of my investment money. You took the right road from a liability perspective. You're even going to be good. Right. And you have to consider, too, that by them selling for, you know, basically and losing a little bit of the investor's money, the operators are getting nothing out of that. Usually there's a structure with a pref and all these different things. So if they sell for a loss, the operators get nothing from that. And so that's to me, that's more respectable than them saying, hey, give us some more money. We might be able to pull this off so that maybe later down the road we can make some money, too. Like, uh, like I, I have more respect for the person's like, Hey, look, the, the business plan didn't work out. We had one of the, the, the craziest rate hiking cycles we've ever seen. It was unprecedented and there's nothing we can really do to, to reasonably salvage this. We're going to cut our losses. Yeah. And it, 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 it I tell people all the time, real estate time is your best friend. But you can connect a bomb to that clock. And that bomb is literally going to go off at the end. And so, you know, time can either be your best friend or it can literally kill you. And so in real estate, if you got a long time, well, guess what? Real estate always goes up. It's like, you know, hey, if you can go out 50 years, you're going to be good, right? So the longer you can do in real estate, the better you are. The short-term fluctuations in real estate are very dangerous. And that's why I tell people, look, if, if you're buying a deal now, the key is to assume that the worst is going to happen and make sure you can weather that storm. Because if you can weather that storm, like if, if you can get through, maybe it's going to be five years of absolute shit show. But if you can survive for five years, by the time you get to year 10, you've made money. Right. And that's the key. Well, but then there's like, you know, the, the the thing that's going on right now is, yes, the absolute worst, what you perceived the absolute worst was two years ago. Um, I don't think anyone perceived the uh, one in one year raising rates a full 5% just because it's so unprecedented. But um, we need to wrap this up. We don't want to get too long in the tooth, but um, you know, it, it's good to kind of we can hypothecate on things that are happening in the real world, but it's good to sometimes see the, the actual effects that are happening. Before you, before you go on though, Kyle, we're almost, I think an hour and 20 minutes. Your hat has not moved. So you should probably take a couple swigs real quick. Oh, take, take a look at his yeah. eyes. He's, he's slurring and his eyes are all glassy. <laughs> no, off camera a few times I adjusted and, and then did that. And then I, put, I just put it back on. Uh, I have bad hair day right now. Um, so, okay. So let's get, let's, let's rattle through this top 10. I, I get the point, Mauricio. You probably don't want to, uh, to, to linger on here, but, uh, going back to the or original segments, we're going top 10 cities where it's better to rent than buy. So basically where that, uh, that Delta that Jay was talking about that percentage more expensive is the highest. So you want to guess number one? I'm going to put all California. Yeah. I was gonna say, uh, yeah California has got to be really up there. 
San Francisco, yeah. San Jose, LA. California does have four in the top 10, but they're actually not number one. Number one is Austin, Texas, which um, I don't think is super surprising considering the run-up we've seen in Austin recent. And then after that, so Austin, Texas, it's actually the uh, the percentage, I think. Um, so you were talking about the average on the uh, on nationally is 50-something. Um, so this includes taxes. So yours didn't include taxes. This includes taxes as one of the costs. Um, so the, the national average is 60%. For Austin, Texas, it's a hundred and thirty-six percent. So quite, and number two is a hundred and one. So it's quite a bit higher than everyone else. Um, but then number two is San Francisco at a hundred. Number three is Columbus at a hundred and one. Um, number uh, four, Sacramento. Then Los Angeles. Then San Jose. Then Portland, Boston, and Seattle to to round it all off. Um, but there's also some silver lining. I thought it would be put some good news for real estate investors. There are three um, in the, uh, so these are only like the top, the, the major cities in the country. There are three where it's actually cheaper to buy still. And that's uh, Memphis, Pittsburgh, and Birmingham, Alabama. There you go. There you go. I wanted to guess that. Yeah. Going right through that. Um, what about, we, what happened to, whatever happened to Detroit? I mean, weren't they like giving away homes like in Detroit? It might be a while ago, but I thought you could buy a home for like seven, you could put a home on your credit card, you know, <laughs> D- Detroit got better for, for a decade, but, uh, but hey, if anybody, started... if anybody lives in Detroit, just leave a comment. Let us know how, uh, what, what's it, what the market's looking like in Detroit. I, I've talked to a couple of people that invest in syndications in Detroit that are, that are struggling right now. Well, it should be getting a lot better, right? All those, uh, all those auto companies that pay the workers are going to start making a lot more money and it's going to just boost that economy. It should be great. That's right. <laughs> Union kick into gear and save um, it. All right. I'll do a real quick dumb question then. Um, for Because we were football Sunday. We just finished that up. We ordered a bunch of big platter of wings and the debate came up. Is it boneless wings or regular wings? What's your preference, AJ? Oh, man. I, I Dude, I different times. Um, let's go. I no, I like the regular regular wings. Isn't isn't the non regular just called nuggets? That's I I agree with that. But nuggets are awesome though. So but nuggets are awesome. Well, that's fine. But then let's have nuggets. Let's not have wings. Like let's, yeah, let's bone, boneless know. boneless wings are not a thing. I, I'm sorry. That just that's that's like pineapple. It's like pineapple on pizza. Well, I think the distinction between bo- boneless wings, but the ding- distinguish between boneless wings and nuggets is like it's like tossed in sauce like buffalo sauce or and it's honey, huge honey barbecue sauce and they're usually bigger than nuggets it's like somewhere in between like a chicken finger and a chicken nugget but yeah i, I agree i don't really consider them wings right it's like big chicken nuggets. i never had a chicken wing until 2010 i was i was nearly 40 years old before i had my first chicken wing um, my wife's from buffalo and like her family made me go out and have wings and is now my favorite food Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. More than sushi? More than sushi? Uh, I, I mean, I love sushi, but we do chicken wings every Sunday. Wow. Chicken wings are awesome. And, and I don't need, and I don't need, I don't need a lot of meat. Like I only eat fish, but I eat chicken wings every Sunday just because I'm, I'm addicted to them. I can eat them every day. So you'd be considered the expert in the group, I guess. I don't think you're addicted, Jay. You're just whipped. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I eat a whole lot more than my wife. <laughs> well, Mauricio, what do you think? Should we stick to the classic wings, or, or yeah, or... of course, yeah. No, I, actually, the, I thought the real question is let's let's do a, a nuance on that. Is it drumsticks or wing wings? Ooh, because I don't like the drumsticks. I think that's BS. Like when I want wings, I want wings. They, they start tossing in those mini, like they 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 murder these little mini baby chickens and then give you the 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 drumstick. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, want I like drumsticks. No, 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 no. Really? But wings. I feel like there's more meat on the drumsticks and they're easier to eat with one hand. But it's not, a, again, get a, get a nugget. It's not, it's not a wing. If, if you're getting a drumstick, it's just a piece of chicken. Like, get a wing. They're called wings for a reason. It's, 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 but it's, they're both, it's both parts of the wing. It's so much easier to eat and there's more meat on it. I feel like it's a no-brainer to go with a drumstick. Wait, how is the drumstick? The drumstick's part of the thigh. Like, that's their legs. It's got nothing to do with the wing. It's the thing that, it, that the wing attaches to. Uh, I, I don't know. I completely disagree with that. I, I feel like AJ's on my side. Drumsticks are awesome. Drumsticks over flats. 
I mean, you can just shred all that meat right off. Yeah, just and you just one hand, one hand, no problem. Like it's like if you if you one hand with the flats, like you kind of have to like pick where you're holding and then shift your your it's grip. It's different. Hey, if you guys if, if you guys love uh, wings and there's a great show called The Hot Ones. Have you guys seen that show? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, one of my favorite podcasts. Yeah, that's one of the greatest. Where they're eating as they do the podcast, they're eating wings with different levels of spiciness as they go through the the thing. It's it's freaking hilarious. As much as I love you guys, if I could do that podcast, I'd be gone in a heartbeat. <laughs> Got it to Sean Evans Jay there. Was tell us out in a heartbeat. Well, they heartbeat. do have they do have some pretty heavy hitting celebrities on there. So no offense to us, but I like I I think anyone would leave for that one. Uh, all right, uh, let's start with AJ. You got anything to plug this week? Man, uh, unprepared, Mauricio. Let's go to you first. Uh, I am. Plugging my real estate syndicator live on Mondays at 1130. If you're a syndicator, come join the group. We're getting a, you know, now that I'm consistent with that time, we had about 35, 40 people show up uh, last week. So come join us, real estate syndicator live.com. You can always rely on Mauricio. He's got that re- real estate syndicator live plug ready to go every time. Uh, Jay, you got something for us? Um, I will be in San Antonio, Texas this weekend at uh, ADP Icon, active duty uh, passive income. So, so um, lots of lots of uh, great uh, uh, military investors uh, out there at a conference. I'll be presenting. So, uh, anybody in San Antonio, stop by ADP Icon. Uh, visit me this weekend. Make make a trip out the Cowboys out there. Their Cowboys is awesome. Cowboys? Yeah, it's it's this massive like. It's a country bar, but it's like the size of like a hockey arena. And it's like just two floors and like it's just the eighteen different bars all around it. It's it's awesome. I I will do that and I'll report back. All right. Appreciate it. AJ, what do you got? Yeah, I'm doing a webinar this week at Wednesday or Thursday, the twenty sixth at two PM Eastern. And it's self storage versus the recession, looking at self storage performance in recessions. Ooh. So if you're a Mauricio in uh, my camp that you think the recession is looming here, then that might be a good one to check it out. That's right. Uh, Once again, I'm going to plug my wife, Badash Investor. Go follow her on socials. Check out her Instagram this time. Uh, I think her Instagram has been great this week. So uh, I think I got a shout out the one time. So go look for me on there. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, my drink is gone. Another great episode. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go hit the head. And so I will see you next Tuesday. See you guys.